Hello, my name is Drew Festini. Um, so you might realize I'm not Jason. Some of you might know Jason. Uh, he's been around for a long time in the embedded Linux uh, space. So Jason couldn't be here today, um, but I'm also part of the BeagleBudder.org Foundation. So I'm going to be speaking to you today about the state of the Beagle and, and kind of getting into some of the things we've done over the last year or two um, that you might not have been aware of, especially since a lot of us have not been able to come to conferences. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, the BeagleBudder.org Foundation, um, we're a nonprofit organization, um, and part of our mission is to improve the state of uh, embedded Linux and more recently Zephyr development. Um, we, we have a broader mission involving education as well. Um, you can find more about that on our website. Um, in, we're based in the U.S., and we're actually a nonprofit organization in the U.S., so that means that uh, corporations and organizations are able to make donations to us and, and uh, get a tax benefit, which really helps to be able to um, uh, get funding from, from additional organizations. Uh, so this is the leadership of the BeagleBudder.org Foundation. So um, we only have one employee or full-time person, which is Christy Long. She's our CEO. Um, and then we have a board of directors, um, which is made up of Jason, um, who would have been speaking here today. He's the Board, uh, he's the president of the board of directors, and he's also the co-founder of the whole project. Uh, and longtime TI engineer, now he has his own um, consulting business. Uh, some of you may know Robert Nelson. He's an engineer at DigiKey, um, but he also handles all the distribution and the kernel builds for the Beagle board, um, BeagleBone, all the different Beagle Beagles that we have. Um, Mark is a professor, um, and he teaches uh, topics around um, embedded systems and computer engineering, um, and he's been using the BeagleBone in his course for a long time. He actually has a lot of his course material on uh, the eLinux wiki, so you might have come across it on there. Uh, my myself, uh, so I work as a Linux kernel engineer for Bay Libra, um, and I've also been involved in a lot of different open source hardware projects. Kind of my relationship with Beagle started um, maybe like 10 plus years ago, I was working on other single board computers. Um, and I was kind of not liking the fact that they were proprietary, like I couldn't get the full schematic and board layout. Um, and I met Jason at a maker fair, which is kind of like a electronic sort of hacking festival. And he was telling me that the BeagleBone is all open source and kind of got into it more and more after that. And Kathy is one of our other board members. Uh, she has a background in wireless and Wi-Fi systems, um, and more recently a microcontroller-based system called uh, Microblocks. So as I was saying, we're a, a community-supported nonprofit. We're based in the United States, um, but our community is global. Um, there's people all around the world that are involved in the project. Um, and one of the things that kind of, I think, differentiates BeagleBoard.org from maybe other single-board computer projects is um, we're really focused on, like, long-term uh, projects, long-term availability. Um, one of our core principles is that we're open source hardware. Uh, so the schematics, the board layout, um, build materials, all available. The parts that we use in the Beagle boards and the Beagle bones, they're all available from distributors like DigiKey or Mauser in low quantity. So if you want to, you can make your own, you can modify the design. And that's kind of one of our core principles. Um, and then there's very interesting projects that have used the BeagleBone over the year, um, like one of the one there is Pocket NC. So it's a small five axis mill, um, really neat little project. Um, and for many of our boards, we've actually gone and done the Open Source Hardware Association certification program. Uh, you can find our boards registered on their, their website. Um, and there's also many different books over the years that have been written um, by engineers and also professors at universities. Has anyone ever used uh, the BeagleBone or the Beagle Board? Okay, the, so <laughs> majority of the people in the room, I would say. So I won't maybe go too in depth into this since it sounds like probably many of you already know this, but um, some of the more uh, recent stuff is um, we did a, a bunch of different uh, Linux embedded engineers um, from like embedded Linux conference got together and helped create tutorials that are all free and online. Originally it was called um, E A L E. Uh, more recently, I think it's called the like the embedded uh, apprentice program. But you can find it at that URL. Um, it's great for getting started. Um, Jason came across that there was a uh, sort of an experiment that JPL was doing where they wanted to like uh, build a little rover that uh, could operate on Earth and have sort of conditions, uh, more uh, adverse conditions. So they actually had a 
Beaglebone Black and a rover that was actually underneath the ice uh, in Alaska to see how it survived those conditions. Um, and there's even a company that made a uh, robot that makes hamburgers using several Beaglebone Blacks, so that's kind of fun too. Um, and uh, while Jason couldn't come here, he did give uh, two talks in Prague back in June, so they're both linked there um, if you want to check those out. And I'll just go back here to the beginning. If you want to visit that URL, it's just bit.ly uh, slash er23-beagle, so you can get all the links in the slides. So if you've not gone to our website recently, check it out. Um, we actually have a wholly redesigned website now. Um, we actually have a project section on there. So if you've done a project with uh, BeagleBoard or uh, Pocket Beagle or uh, BeagleBone, um, please list it on there. Um, or if you're interested to see what projects people have done, you can find it on there. Um, we also, we've had a blog for a while, but now Jason and some other people are trying to be more consistent with it. So if you check out our blog, we're, we're, we have stuff uh, every week or every couple of weeks on there. Um, and we also have a lot of educational materials, um, including uh, we link to the Bootlin courses, which is very exciting that they've used the BeagleBone Black and a couple of different boards in their trainings. And they actually have one of our latest boards that I'm going to talk about called the Beagle Play um, in their most recent course. Um, we also have a forum now. Has anyone been to the forum yet? OK, only one person. All right, good, good I'm bringing that up then. Uh, so this is uh, based on the Discourse software. Uh, not Discord, but Discourse. I think it works pretty well. I think it works better. We used to use a Google group, and I don't think that necessarily worked that well. So um, we kind of divided it up into different project areas. So uh, please go on there, check it out. Um, whatever area you're working in with uh, different Beagle projects, you'll, they'll be in a place in there for that. And then, uh, does anyone use Discord? Few people, okay. Um, so I think I prefer IRC, and I'm, we do still have Beagle on Libera Chat. Um, but I think for some users, they were looking for something different. So we do not have a Discord chat. Um, if you are open to using that, it is pretty active. So um, please check that out um, if you're into Discord. Um, and then more recently, we now have a bi-weekly kind of video podcast uh, or video stream um, called uh, BeagleCast. Uh, we have guests on. Uh, we actually had uh, Thomas from Bootlin on uh, maybe a month ago or something like that, talking about their training. So um, that was really fun. And the most recent one, we actually had a, a manager from Imagination on. So <laughs> I think that was actually just from earlier this week. So that was quite interesting. So um, check, please check that out. We used to have things on GitHub and other various places. Uh, we started hosting our own GitLab instance. So um, you can find all the hardware designs and all the software and firmware and all those sorts of things on our git.beagleboard.org. Um, we also have a new docs website. Um, and it's based on Sphinx. So it's much nicer looking, I think, than what we used to have in the past. Um, and we've had some, uh, both some Google Summer of Code people that have worked on that, and also some people that we've uh, contracted who are former GSOC students to keep uh, keep doing that. And uh, I guess since everyone in here, seem, or at least half the people seem to have used the BeagleBone, you probably at some point downloaded our images. Um, we also have a new page for the images. Like we used to kind of list them, I think, on eLinux Wiki and like, like kind of a weird page on our website. But now we, I think we have a much better designed page and you can filter based on the hardware you have. Um, and you know, we have a wide variety of images for like full desktop, console only, IoT, different sort of use cases for the different hardware. Um, and I try to do like little screenshots of some of the talks, but we've been doing Google Summer of Code since 2010. So we have like many generations of students and mentors. Um, I think it's really driven a lot of the innovation and cool things I think that Beagle's done over the years. So um, if you're in industry, we always can use mentors. Um, so please, you know, check out our GSOC page. Uh, we're always looking for mentors. We're always looking for ideas. And then around January, we'll start applying. And then we'll be asking for students to look and get into ideas. So if you're a student, please check out our GSOC. If you're an engineer um, that's working in industry, please uh, consider being a mentor. Has anyone uh, seen our BeagleBone AI64? This is the newer 64-bit version. Uh, has anyone seen this port yet? OK, oh, interesting. So no one has. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, we had a BeagleBone AI. And that was still a 32-bit um, TI part. Uh, this is a newer board that came out last year. And this has a pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, SOC from TI. It's more of an automotive part. Um, but in addition to uh, 
dual Cortex A72s. There's also uh, several different DSPs on there um, and also some different accelerators. So this has a lot of capabilities. It also has the PRUs and also has um, uh, micro, other microcontrollers as well. I think some M4s on there. So there's a lot of capability on this board. It's about, I think, 170 euros, but um, there's a lot of kind of heterogeneous competing possibilities on this board. So if any of you had used the older BeagleBone AI uh, from a few years ago, uh, that used something called the TI Deep Learning Library. And it was not ideal because it had like some closed source components to it. So one of the things that's nice about this newer one, the AI64, is the like the AI acceleration is all, is based on an open stack. Um, so the software that's running on the DSP and the MMA is another accelerator. All that is open source, um, so you can take a look at the code that's running um, on that. Um, so I think it's uh, interesting because a lot of the other, I think, solutions don't necessarily have. Uh, fully open firmware running on them, so this might be interesting. It's also in contrast to the previous one, which was not quite so open in terms of the like the NPU stack. Um, also, uh, we've made it so it's pretty easy to use Python if you don't want to use C. Um, and it's much easier now to bring in your own models. Like if you have a TI light model or a TensorFlow light model, um, you can bring that in with open source tools. In the past, you used to have to use this uh, kind of proprietary TI tool, but that's all over with. Um, and they make it really easy for you to like also just selecting the existing models. And we have a nice tutorial. Um, I think one of our former GSOC students wrote it. So it goes through the sort of different things you can do with it in terms of the AI models. And our most recent or our most recent ARM-based board is the Beagle Play. Uh, has anyone seen the Beagle Play yet? A few people. Uh, Cool thing is Bootlin actually has updated their course to use it, so um, there's some really good material out there for it. So this is this uh, chip that's in it, the AM62 from TI. This is really meant to be kind of the successor to the AM3, which is what's in the BeagleBone Black. Um, so kind of it's focusing on that kind of lower cost industrial market. Um, the other parts that were like in the BeagleBone AI, they were like automotive parts, so kind of a different price point. Uh, but this is really meant to be something that uh, it's going to be widely used in like lots of different uh, industrial and embedded systems. And we do have the cube, so if there's any questions, uh, ask for the cube, and it should come flying in your direction. But uh, So feel free to interrupt me. I mean, I'm just trying to hopefully bring up the things that have been going on over the last couple of years. Um, but I know many of you have probably used the Beagle, so if you have any questions, just, just uh, raise your hand, and the thing will come flying at you. Uh, so one of the things that's notable about this is this is, uh, I think, about 70 euros. No, it's less than 100 euros. Uh, so this is our first 64-bit board that's more affordable. The BeagleBone AI64 was more expensive. Um, so in addition to the Quad a A53s, it also has an M4 in the PRU, which you might have used on the BeagleBone Black and those other boards. Um, the other thing that's interesting on here is we have a lot of wireless networking capabilities. Um, including sub, sub gigahertz, so sort of longer range uh, wireless. Um, we also have an interesting thing called single pair ethernet, um, which allows you to kind of use existing like copper infrastructure you might have in your home. Um, and then the other thing that's quite interesting, and one of the things that had been kind of frustrating over the years with the uh, Beagle Bones was that we didn't have any form of like open source GPU um, driver. And with this chip, uh, TI, uh, put into uh, the deal that they had with Imagination that there would be an open source driver. So Imagination has developed both Mesa and Linux uh, driver that's open source. Um, so that, that work is, I think, nearly upstream if it's not already. So um, kind of a big change from the past is we actually have uh, open source graphics stack on this board. So one of the things that we have on here that's also kind of interesting is um, there's a lot of different modules that you might have seen. There's this microbus, which is this little dual inline package. And they have like, I think, nearly 1,000 different microbus click boards. Also, Seed Studio has the Grove. And uh, there's also the Quick. So we have the connectors on here for you to be able to use all these different modules. Um, you know, quite easily. We don't have the traditional BeagleBone headers, but we do have a, lot, have a lot of options for you to be able to 
kind of rapidly prototype and plug in different little modules that already exist. We also uh, have this concept called Beagle Connect that's based on uh, sub gigahertz wireless networking um, that's kind of like longer range, lower data throughput. Jason wrote a good uh, blog post about kind of the initial experience with the Beagle Play. So if you're interested about it, please check that out. Um, and one of the things that might interest some of you is uh, my colleague Matisse from Bay Libra. Uh, he uh, got Android AOSP running on it, and we got a picture right there of that. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, as usual, TI does a pretty good job with upstreaming. So uh, there's a U-Boot series uh, for the Beagle Play uh, that I think has been merged. And then uh, there's also a kernel series for the device tree, I think, that's been merged as well. So I mentioned that Beagle Connect. Um, so this is our idea of having kind of a system of wireless nodes in a, in a gateway um, that can communicate over uh, lower power, longer range networks. Um, so the first board that we have that complements this sort of concept is called the Beagle Connect Freedom. Uh, this is the first time we've had something that's not in full SOC. So this is actually just a microcontroller um, and it's running Zephyr instead of Linux. Um, and similarly, this also has that microbus connector. Um, so there's a wide range, I guess, over a thousand different little microbus, micro, uh, I guess they call them clicks with the uh, micro electronic uh, microbus uh, connector on it. Um, it also has uh, 2.4 gigahertz, so it can also do BLE. Um, so it's meant for kind of like longer range, lower data rate, sort of like sensor applications. Um, we also have a couple of things on board, including, a, a, I think we have a temperature humidity sensor on there as well. But the reason for doing the Beagle Connect Freedom was to kind of expand on this concept that Jason had um, and some of the other people in the organization about, it'd be really neat if we had like a, like a kind of a network of little sensor boards and they could talk to a board running Linux and maybe have a little bit more seamless than what we traditionally would have. Um, and maybe not have to write firmware that runs on the microcontroller, maybe have some way to get the sensor data out of those little uh, microcontroller boards without having to always make firmware. You know, because it's nice in Linux, you know, we have a lot of tools when you're on a Linux system, on an embedded Linux system, um, but there's also higher power, you know, so you kind of want the ease of using a Linux system, but you also want to have like the lower power, lower footprint of having like little sensor nodes that might be running uh, an RTOS like Zephyr. So, and then kind of an aside here. So the solution we came up with, um, and this was mainly driven by Jason, also some of our Google Summer of Code um, students, um, and actually uh, originally kind of inspired by a talk that uh, my colleague from Bay Libra, uh, Alex, gave, uh, I think, like five or six years ago uh, at ELC Europe um, about using Graybus for IoT projects. But um, for those of you that aren't aware, though, I know many, probably some people in this room probably even worked on the project, but uh, a few years ago, there was the idea of having a modular uh, smartphone uh, where you'd have these little tiles that would plug into the phone and give different... Um, functionality. So that in order for that to work, there was an electrical uh, specification called UniPro that would like handle the electrical contacts and those sorts of stuff. But for the higher level, like from the logical level, there needed to be this sort of uh, system for having these pluggable modules. Um, and that, that system is called Graybus. So Graybus was originally meant to be the thing that would allow you to plug in this module and then Linux would know or the Linux or the microcontroller running on it would know, hey, you know, this new module's been plugged in, what are the capabilities of it, and be able to like announce that to the system. Uh, unfortunately, that kind of didn't really do much in terms of the smartphone industry. The idea here is to reuse that Graybus idea and use it in the context of IoT. So kind of this uh, box all the way on the right, kind of the idea here is it would be interesting if we had a Linux system that's connected to a microcontroller and then over some arbitrary transport like wireless, we could then connect to a remote microcontroller that's connected to uh, various sensors over you know, I2C or SPI or GPIO pins, um, but that we wouldn't have to write like the firmware running on it, um, that we would kind of be transparently just show up on our Linux system. 
and we wouldn't have to necessarily worry about the firmware that was running on either of the MCUs or microcontrollers. Um, so the initial concept that was developed um, over the last couple of years um, by Jason, um, there was also a couple of contractors that worked with us, um, one of which was uh, Christopher Freet, who does a lot of uh, uh, Zephyr development, um, was to come up with a solution where we can buy both uh, Linux and Zephyr to have this idea of a system where uh, we can plug sensors into a remote board and have them show up um, to, the, to the Linux operating system that's running on the gateway uh, as a sensor that's plugged in directly to the system. In a sense, it doesn't know that it, it's being connected over a wireless network. So this is kind of, I think, maybe the easiest way to show like embedded Linux people what it's like. So the driver probes, or first you can look and see the I2C network. You see these uh, devices that show up on the I2C bus. They're actually not directly connected to the SSC running Linux. They're actually connected from, to uh, the remote MCU that's then talking over either Bluetooth, BLE, or uh, 802.15.4 low power um, wireless network um, back over to the microcontroller that's on the gateway board. And then that microcontroller is communicating over a UART to the Linux system. In the, on top of like the physical communication, the logical thing that's allowing the remote microcontroller to declare what's plugged into it is, is gray bus. And the idea of creating these gray bus manifests that describe what capabilities the remote uh, microcontroller system has. So the cool thing here is this is actually connected, uh, I think in this case it's probably over BLE, um, but could also be over 802.15.4. Um, and in this case, it's a humidity sensor that's on the Beagle uh, Connect Freedom board. Uh, and that just shows up like if it was connected over your local I2C bus. Um, so that's kind of the idea here is to kind of simplify the ability of um, being able to leverage all the drivers and capabilities that we already have in Linux, uh, especially for a lot of these sensors, you know, there's already drivers and IAO for all these. So if we can have a way to expose them, these remote sensors to the IAO subsystem, then we don't need to worry about like writing drivers on the microcontroller board or anything like that. So here's kind of a diagram of the existing system that was changed a little bit after our uh, Google Summer of Code this year. So the existing system had a bit of an issue of we had to go out of the kernel into a user space program called GBridge for gray bus bridge and then back down into the kernel. Um, and that made it kind of brittle. And there was instances in which uh, uh, this could cause the kernel to hang. So it wasn't a really, it wasn't a very good design. So uh, this year, uh, one of our students in GSOC, Ayush, he proposed uh, coming up with a solution for this, which has worked out pretty well. So the idea here is to eliminate that G-Bridge user space application uh, that, because uh, it's kind of silly to be in the kernel and then going back to user space and back into the kernel. Uh, eliminate that and move that component or do, move the things that the G-Bridge did in user space, move those things into the firmware that's running on the uh, CC1352, which is the little wireless microcontroller that's on the Beagle Play. And let me flip to this one so you can see the diagram here. So on the Beagle Play board, we have the AM62, which is the big SOC that's running Linux. And then we also have a little uh, wireless microcontroller on the Beagle Play that uh, CC1352. That's how the Beagle Play is able to do these different uh, uh, wireless networking capabilities. Um, and then we have the same microcontroller on that Beagle Connect Freedom board, which is that microcontroller board. Um, and in this case, instead of having some of this gray bus functionality in a Linux application running in user space, those components, which is the AP bridge and the SVC, those have moved into the firmware that's running on the microcontroller. So this provides a more robust solution than what we had previously um, and seems to be a good way going forward. So as part of the Google Summer of Code, um, a lot of the work was done in the firmware, that's the Zephyr firmware that's running on the microcontroller uh, at the bottom there that's on the Beagle Play. So that's the main thing that was replaced. But in addition, there was this platform driver um, that's underneath the, the higher level gray bus driver that Ayush wrote. Um, and he's calling that the G, uh, GB Beagle Play driver, though I think the, the name might change, but 
if anyone's interested in this and you have some experience in Linux, um, please go check out the patch series. I think he would like more feedback um, to see how we can get this uh, further refined so it can be into a state that we can upstream it. And the last topic I have is risk five, a little bit on risk five. But before I get into the risk five, is there any questions on any of the things I've talked about already with like the Beagle Play or the Beagle Connect? I know it's a bit of like a weird concept if you've not seen it discussed before. So um, it's, it's meant to kind of simplify like embedded development, but I know it can be a bit uh, confusing. All right, so I guess in the few minutes we might have left here, uh, I'm going to talk about something I was quite excited about. So for a while, I've been wanting to do a RISC-V-based uh, uh, Beagle, uh, Beagle board. Uh, and we, we had some initial efforts that didn't quite work out. Um, but this last July, we launched the Beagle 5 Ahead. Uh, and this has an SOC from T-Head. So if you're not familiar with T-Head, uh, their main business is designing uh, RISC-V cores and licensing those cores. Um, so they're similar to Sci-5, but they're based in China. Um, and they're part of Alibaba. Um, and it's interesting that I think Alibaba is looking at using some of these RISC-V designs in uh, their data center. This one it has a core that's much more capable than the existing ones that we had that were based on uh, some of the older in-order uh, core designs. Um, and this one is a out-of-order uh, core 12-stage pipeline. So it's quite a bit higher performance than probably if, if you have any boards that or don't have this, have maybe older SOCs, this is probably going to give you more performance. Um, the benchmarks are a bit tricky because one of the downsides to this chip is that it, there's a vector extension for RISC-V, which is quite exciting. Uh, it gives a lot of capabilities, similar to like ARM Neon or even ARM SVE, um, or in the Intel world, you know, uh, like MMX or SSE or more recently the different AVX ones. Um, so you can get a lot of performance out of having vector instructions in your instruction set. Um, so while this does have this, it, it was designed a few years ago before the vector extension for RISC-V had been fully ratified. Um, so unfortunately, it's not compatible with the upstream support in GCC um, for, for those in vector instructions. So if you want to get the full performance out of this, you do need to use the tool chain from T-Head um, that uses their um, pre-ratified version of Vector. Uh, however, I don't really care about that as all, at all personally because I'm interested in upstreaming. Um, and I think even without the Vector operations, it still outperforms um, like the other boards that might be based on like the U74 cores. Um, so that is one caveat. Uh, you know, we're kind of at this time right now where kind of the existing silicon uh, didn't have the capability to, you know, use the extensions that were ratified uh, after they were designed. Um, so uh, my main interest here has been uh, trying to get things upstreamed uh, in Linux for it. So uh, the SDK that T had released, which is what we officially support on the board. So we ship a Yocto-based image on the board. Uh, and all the hardware capabilities work in that. This is based on a 5.10 kernel from T-Head. Um, now, we also have an Ubuntu image and a Debian image um, that for some people, you know, they prefer uh, the capabilities in, in our Debian or Ubuntu image. However, the CSI, the camera interface, and the GPU don't fully work in those. Um, so it kind of depends on what peripherals you're interested in. Um, they're all enabled in our Yocto image that ships on the board. Um, but if you want the experience of like a binary uh, distro, then uh, right now those aren't working. And that kind of ties back to what I was talking about earlier about this kind of uh, impedance mismatch on the different versions of the vector instructions. However, if you're interested in mainline development, which is what I'm kind of interested in in the context of RISC-V, is myself and some other on the list of our mailing list, or, uh, we've been working on a series of patches. So right now we have Ethernet networking working. Um, we have the EMMC working, and someone just posted yesterday a uh, patch series for the USB controller. I've not had a chance to test it yet, but um, so I think hopefully by the end of the year we'll have more of the functionality uh, fleshed out, but I think we're close to having enough that would make it a, 
a capable board if you need to build uh, natively on Risk Five and you want to use a mainline kernel. You know, we, I think my guess would be for six seven we can probably get EMMC and networking working, Ethernet networking, which means if you wanted to use it as like a builder, I think uh, it could be up to that task. So. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. And if you have any interest in um, RISC-V Linux kernel development, I think uh, this SOC is an interesting one to get involved with. And uh, there are several of us that are collaborating on the mailing list right now. Uh, and that's kind of all I have in terms of prepared slides. Um, so are there any questions or comments? Did you did you mention the price point of the Beagle Five? Uh, yeah, the Beagle Five is about 150. Uh, it, it varies a bit based on where you are and which distributor, but it's around that. And I guess one of the things I should say with the Beagle Five is this board specifically is the Beagle Five ahead. The idea with Beagle Five, it's our brand of Risk Five boards, and we intend to have more Risk Five boards with different different capabilities, different price points. Um, so, you know, look for that in the future, but we intend to do more um, in the future as well. All right, I, I guess if no one else has any questions, uh, thank you for attending. It's lunchtime.